Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Samir Joshi. You can call me Dr. J. I'm trying to get that to catch on. My employees are calling me that, but nobody else as of yet. Um, so how do we get the slides to go? Aha. Uh -huh. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk about AI and machine learning as it is applied in cybersecurity today. So the principle that I will talk about today has been, we have applied it in healthcare, we have applied it in uh, national intelligence, cyber, banks, we've applied it and validated this principle in a bunch of domains. The example that I will bring today is from uh, national intelligence. So I'm talking about supercharging machine learning, but if I am, Another way of looking at this is I'm talking about the feasibility of machine learning, right? When is machine learning possible? When is it not possible? In real world applications, there is a specific situation that we run into many times where machine learning is absolutely not feasible and what do we do in that particular scenario? So the big takeaway that I want you to uh, remember from today is that this process which I will be talking about, which is data fusion, is an indispensable part of machine learning and AI. All right. So automated data utilization is, is very important. When we talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, what we are really saying is that the amount of data that is being generated has and has for a while been beyond the human cognitive threshold. A person cannot look at the censored data that has been generated by cyber sources such as Silk or NetFlow or tickets or whatever you might have. Uh, no human can look at this data and say, aha, there's the girl in the red dress amongst all the matrix type code that is flowing down the screen. That's really not going to happen. So you need these tools, uh, machine learning and AI, to, to even think about applying and utilizing these data sources. There's an opportunity here. Data is like a light dust that is sitting on every object in our world. The data coverage is increasing. The sensors that we have around us are proliferating every day, which means that if we can actually understand what these sensors are saying to us, we have a realistic model of the world. It's no different from human cognition in the sense that we have our senses, our sight, taste, et cetera, and we cover the world, or we at least uh, sense the world through, through our senses. And the same thing is happening in the uh, digital domain. And if you can pull all these senses together, then you understand if you're holding a real apple or a plastic apple. You know, you need multiple senses to tell you that. Uh, but of course, there are more problems too, more opportunities, more problems. The, Data size, big data, that's a problem that everybody is familiar with. The speed of data, everybody is familiar with. I will not be talking about those. I, in my mind, those problems have essentially been solved. Uh, the problem that I will be talking about today is the variety of data, which is a nice segue from the previous talk we had today, which, is about, which was about silos, information silos, data silos. What can be shared, what should be shared. All right. So let's just talk about training data for machine learning. Assume that there's a data source. Let's just call it data source one. I have very cleverly anonymized everything, if not very creatively. Uh, so data source one is producing a stream of data. You can take that data and use part of it as trading data, use part of it as testing data, and you can essentially deploy a machine learning algorithm on it. And now this is, this is a very common way that machine learning is used, and this is a well understood, uh, by no means mature, there's a lot of work being done here and will continue to be done here, but this is a very well understood way of how to do things. Uh, all our machine learning statistical theories, uh, uh, sample complexity, and, and other ways of quantifying machine learning, they apply very readily to this domain. So this science, we are good, we have the science. The primary challenges here are the speed of the data, which I think is mostly under control, the richness and the quality of the data, which a data scientist sits down, 
the poor guy spends a lot of time cleaning up the data till it's ready to be analyzed by a machine. Uh, but here's the problem. The insights that this provides are limited to whatever the data source one can tell you. If data source one is your site, you can bite into a plastic apple because you can't smell it. You don't know it's real or not. All right, so the real world is more complex. This is, this is what I'm seeing uh, in almost all our clients, or all our uh, client verticals, rather, that people are not, uh, people have applied single sources, even in our government domains and, and what is being increasingly funded as we move into the future. Single sources, people have been working for a while, or on them for a while, and people understand how they work. Uh, putting things together is still a challenge. There are many different data sources, and the pieces of the puzzle are hidden across the different data sources. And so the additional challenge here becomes the variety of the data. All these data sources, one, two, three, four, they may be talking about different things. They may be entirely different formats, entirely different velocities of data. And yet, only when you pull them together do you see that the adversary is, for instance, pretending to attack in one place, but yet their objective is broader, for instance, in the cyber domain, right? So to see the big picture is essential. Now, the challenge here, the hidden challenge is that really this is a system of systems, because data source one, two, three, four, they're all systems. And if you're looking at that elephant, that is a system of systems where each part is an independently moving part. So how do we apply that? Um, well, let's, let's start with this. Can I just take my machine learning and ask it to learn everything? Okay, I had a learning algorithm for one source. I'll deploy one for each one of those four sources. Oh, wait, now I need a fifth method which will put all of them together. Somebody has to assemble the elephant too. Okay, can I do that? No, you cannot. Uh, in my years of practice, I've not seen a good, successful example of this. And the reason for this is that the hypothesis space is too large, and there's no easy way to stitch the various models together because each one of those data sources uh, may, may require a different type of model. Can I prepare the data by hand? Well, yes and no. Yes, that is what most organizations end up doing. No, that it is not a strategic or a cheap way of doing things. What ends up happening is that it's, it just takes a lot of time to, to kind of munge all these data sources together. And once you've done that, remember it was a system of systems, uh, of moving parts, something changes. And then suddenly all that and not so pretty code that you wrote to put all these data sources together is no longer current. And uh, so there was a Forbes study, which is one of my favorites, um, a qualitative study, but nonetheless, they tried to measure what data scientists do. Right? What do they spend their time doing? And it turns out that data scientists spend about 80% of their time just preparing the data for machine learning. 80% of their time. And they said it's the most amount of time we put into something on our daily, daily lives. It's also the least enjoyable part of our time. Because, you know, I didn't go to school. I didn't study machine learning to clean up this Excel. And yet that's what they end up doing. And this cost is compounded in this scenario when you're trying to learn something across different data sources. So what is the path forward? Data fusion. So data fusion is essentially... Uh, putting together, pulling together the different data sources, standardizing each data source so that it is standard in every way. It, it has the same attribute names, for instance, the same data types, the same type system, the same units, that's very important, uh, and the same conventions. So this, this part is hard enough, but that's a problem that we have already solved. And then but that, that is what is traditionally understood as data unification or data integration. Data fusion is one step beyond that. Data fusion is so that the data is, is formatted so that there is one record for one real world entity. So we worked for a bank recently. Um, I'm, I'm gonna switch up the example from the cyber a little bit. And they have multiple systems, right? So let's say they have a mortgage system. 
and then they have a checking account, and then they have the person who called in to complain about their branch, which was me. So I called in, and I gave my name as, you know, Dr. J, right? But in the mortgage system, my name is full Dr. Samir Joshi, right? It's, it's the very clean systems. And the checking account, it just says Samir Joshi. So now I have three different names within one bank. If they unify or integrate all these data sources, there are still going to be three records for one real world entity, which is me. Fusion is the process of putting all of these things together so that there is one record which contains all the information about me and all my aliases as well. So this is, this is a process which is essentially, we have discovered is essentially deterministic and can be processized. We did that, we turned it into a product, we validated the product in multiple domains, so this is all done. It's a difficult problem, but it's solved. And the, the my hypothesis that I'm putting forth today, uh, the assertion that I'm putting forth today, is that data fusion is an essential prerequisite to machine learning across multiple data sources. So all right, a couple of things which will be, uh, I think this room already realizes, is that data quality and data trust have to be built in. And I'll leave it at that, and I'll, if, if anybody has questions about those, I'm happy to go into details. Right, so once you have one fused data stream instead of four disparate uh, data streams, your machine learning algorithm goes back to uh, a single enriched high quality data baseline that it has to learn on. And now this data baseline, it contains all the pieces of the puzzle. So you can really up the complexity of your algorithm. Now here's a case study. Um, this is a study from, uh, this case study is from National Intelligence, and uh, we were trying to solve a cyber problem for them, and of course everything's been sanitized, but uh, on one end you see Twitter, which was our, also an open source intelligence, and then the government cyber components, there were two databases, with none of which were relational, one was a NoSQL database, the other one was a document database, uh, the document database was MongoDB, and the NoSQL database was a database called Accumulo, and, uh, which is like HBase, but more secure. Uh, and, and so these are all open source toolkits. You can look them up. The data they had there was what you would expect cyber data to look like. A lot of IP addresses, a lot of sensor data, a lot of NetFlow data, and so on and so forth. A bunch of data sources that they had already put together here. So that's your cyber data, multiple data sources put together in these two databases, none of which are traditional. Now the, the green color, uh, the green boxes that you see there were the intelligence databases. Intelligence data is very different from cyber data in that intelligence data is very deliberate. It's very rich. It is collected and verified by human beings, right? Often human beings generate it. They go out and they observe something and they come back and tell you. This is what I saw. This is what's going on. This is bad. This is the bad guy. And you put it all together. And now these databases and these data modalities reflected that thoughtfulness or, or that velocity, I should say. Uh, the example I'd like to point out is that there is a certain relational warehouse that had 300 plus tables, which was used to track something, uh, or track some entities, right? So cyber data obviously has part of the puzzle. So we know that somebody is trying to break into a network. The intelligence data obviously has part of the puzzle. And then, of course, there are these procedural databases, which are your models, your metadata, your provenance, your pedigree. All these things are important because this kind of metadata, while it is not very glamorous, it has to be a part of the puzzle. Otherwise, the end product does not have the data trust built in. Right? You need to have explainable AI, not just AI. So, okay, so this was the setup, and what we did was we pulled it all together into uh, one fusion hub, we, all we fused it all together, and then we ran both analytics on it and compliance on it. So the, the reason I left the compliance and governance little screenshot in is to drive home the fact that if you cannot guarantee the quality of the data at the end of the process, then its utility in the real world is very limited. So you have to think of these things in advance and build them in. Quality data, 
pedigree and provenance data, it's all data. It has to go with the entity data. All right, so this is the first step. This is what we started with, right? We took, this is a screenshot of the data itself. Um, the, the raw data was really, really messy. It was a hairball. It was awful. It was chaos theory at its best. Uh, I don't know if there was a theory in there or just chaos. But uh, you'll take a look at this and you'll see that there are many different types of graphs. The little stretchy things that you see at uh, the bottom right is probably the cyber data. Very simple data, maybe an IP address coupled with a couple of other data points and, and that's that, right? So very simple data structure. The data structure that you see on the left-hand side, the little floating Y, is probably Twitter. A little bit richer, a little bit more, a little bit of you know, nesting and, uh, and, and so on, but still essentially simple. The big hairy spiders that you see in the middle uh, are the intelligence data. Very rich, very big entities, and so on and so forth. Now these are all very different. Some of them may be, for instance, measuring things in pounds, and yet other spiders in here may be measuring things in kilograms, right? They all have different names. Some of them are from XML, some of them are JSON, some of them are text. We don't know. Step two is unification. Standardizing everything to be of, in the same data model. Now there are some questions here. Is an Uber model possible? I don't think so. There are many tips and tricks uh, that we use to unify this very diverse set of data sources and put, put this all together. And now it is unified. It's a lot cleaner than the previous one. You can see that they're all joined together into one structure, but it's still sort of voluminous. Once we applied data fusion, this was the reality. This is it. All the previous mess that we had, and, and you know, it doesn't even fit the screen, all of it was talking about three people. Three people who had aliases on Twitter, aliases on other social media and other cyber databases, and their real names were in the intelligence databases. Once you put it all together and once you can fuse the data, you get this nice, simple, organized, minimal thing. And what this does is it provides the perfect baseline for machine learning. That's it. All of this to get to machine learning. Otherwise, what you end up doing is you give this to your machine learning algorithm and you say, good luck, go figure it out, and it will never return. It would be a, a failure like Ben Affleck's Batman, I don't know. Um, I saved that joke just for this room. <laughs> All right, so uh, here we are. That's the outcome. There are other benefits that come along with it, such as uh, the sample complexity is reduced dramatically. I, I just mentioned that the AI will not work, the machine learning will not work if you just give it the hairball and try, it, uh, try to have it learn it all. Uh, it provides a high quality and consistent data baseline. So if you have three different data science teams, they're all working off the same picture. If they talk to each other, they have a human API to talk to each other. If one of them says, I don't know, sale, he means the same thing as the other team uh, when he says sale. Um, it eliminates repetitive data prep. When you unify and fuse data, uh, if you have a data science team, if anybody has run a data science team, you know very well if you've paid their salaries, you know even better that most of them end up doing the same thing over and over again, and five different people on the team would be doing the same thing 80% of the time, because it, that's the way it has to be done, and what they do is difficult to reuse. So what this architecture does, the data fusion architecture, sort of, uh, I think it eliminates, near eliminates, but it definitely cuts down on the repetitive data prep. And here's the, another big benefit. It auto-discovers new data sources. So if you plug in a new data source, your machine learning algorithm may say, I work with social media, and if I plug in Instagram, which I didn't have before, because the machine learning algorithm is not working off the Instagram data model, it's working off the fused data model, new data sources are auto-discovered and fed in automatically. So that solves a lot of problems, raises a few others, but we don't have time to talk about that. So I think that's the last slide. Any 
Any questions? We have time for one question for Dr. J. Oh, well, thank you for that, <laughs> Dr. Watson. By the way, there is a basketball that's stuck up here. It's, you can't see it. It's on, the, it's on this, uh, and maybe you can help us out. <laughs> uh, uh, call me Dr. Josh. Call me Samir. <laughs> Backpedal very quickly there. Dr. J, um, I've been involved in analytics for a very long time, and I definitely agree that 80% of your time is working with data. And so when you're dealing with that data, you say, well, you kind of have to put it in a format, you know, make it square the database, you know, make it align. But is there any machine learning algorithms that help you with that task of cleaning the data, harmonizing the data? Because it, that's the frustrating part. And then when you put it into you know, the algorithms to do the analytics, obviously, you know, you'll spend maybe if the project's a year, you'll spend a month or maybe even less doing the actual analytics. That's right. That's right. And, and thank you for that question. That is a brilliant question and one that's very close to my heart. Uh, so let me answer this question in two parts. First, before we get to is there an automated way to harmonize the data, we need a standard in which to represent the harmonized data. That's the first thing. If a human generates the harmonization or a machine generates the harmonization, there is a standard in which to express the harmonization itself. So that is the first contribution, right? So uh, for instance, once we did that, and it took us years to get there, uh, once we did that, once we succeeded at that, um, generating that harmonization for us was uh, a fraction of the time, maybe 10 or 15% of the time. We, we did a head-to-head -head race. We had a Python programmer, a PhD candidate, very smart guy. Um, he, being very familiar with Python, tried to pull in a new data source, which was some I think uh, Census Bureau or some, some data source. And the same data source we tried to pull in using our system, the Fusion Hub system, the Fusion Hub system took only about 10 to 15% of the time. So incredibly fast, right? So the, the human process must be made fast. That's step one. Step two, once you have that harmonization standard, can you have a machine learning ge algorithm generate that harmonization standard? The answer is yes-ish. And I, I say this because there are some companies out there that offer things like that. And once you go deep, you realize a lot of it is just smoke and mirrors. There, this is not a solved problem. And uh, there are definitely, we use a bunch of algorithms which study data types, which study data distributions, which study data semantics, and, and try and come up with, the, with something that helps the human being. So we accelerate the process greatly. Is there a fully automated approach? Only in PowerPoints sold by companies. Well, uh, does that answer your question? Yes. All right, well, thank you, everyone. And please reach out to me with any questions.